you both. Fair weather today. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our. How many of stakeholder meeting are we on now? Number four. The fourth okay. stakeholder meeting. Yeah. We really appreciate all of you come out to talk to us about regional east-west mobility, the concerns that we all have, the problems we found, and possible solutions that we can look at to improve the mobility in the region. So you've got the um, agenda for today. Um, I have just realized that I have for the first time forgotten to do something, and that is print an attendance register. Can you copy the last one? It's, it's in the, um, so it's on the server under the thing. Sorry, we'll print one and pass it around to you because I don't like to have a roll call. This is a stakeholder meeting. It's not a formal committee of fanboys, so we don't have formal minutes and we don't have formal instructions, but we just do pass the list around just to people to tick their name off. We'll get that to you. For some reason, it slipped my mind today. We're really excited to get on with the study. Our agenda today, depending on how much discussion you want to have, might be the shortest of our four meetings because it's very focused. We have two key items to talk about today. The one is the next memo, the next technical memo, which looks at starting to work towards solutions, so proposals, right? And these are just a first look at what some proposals or some solutions might look like. Then we're just going to update you on the fact that we're working, to, working towards a report, and there's not a lot to say on that right now, but that's the process, what the next steps look like. And then we're going to introduce our consultants to you for the phase two effort. Um, they're starting at the end of this month, but they just come today to just say hi, introduce themselves, um, and we're going to introduce them to you. And they're going to be taking the study further, and we'll be presenting to you all, to the Stanford Tech and the Policy Committee, proposed final solutions for our East-West Mobility Challenges. And they're going to be done in two sections. The first part is the transit bike head solutions. The second part will be a heavy lift on roadway solutions. And I'm looking at Stephen because we presented those 13 roadways that we want to look at. And we got some questions on the policy committee about one or two of those roadways because VDOT's doing some work on them now and just finished some work. And I'm inviting you guys to make your comments in phase two when we're looking at those 13 roadways. Because really, our goal is to try and build regional solutions between now and the year 2050, dealing with those two metrics. What are the two metrics we've kept on looking at? Congestion and accessibility. So I meant what I said at the policy committee. I invite you guys to make your comments at the time when we get into the roadways in phase two. So that's all I'm gonna say by way of introduction. Matthew is gonna run through the slides for you. You've all got the full memo, right, in your inbox. So all we're doing here is highlighting some points in that memo. This is not the whole memo, it's just we've taken some slides with content that you already have, just to remind you, and then we'll have some discussion and questions and um, we'll take the matter further after that. So I'm gonna hand over to Matthew to do the presentation and I'll chip in if I need to, any comments. And before we move on, for those in the room and those online, um, you'll find our East-West study page on the FAMPO website by clicking East-West Mobility Study. You'll find the meeting agenda on the page. If you click on presentations, I just posted the meeting for a presentation. You're also able to view all the presentations from the previous meeting, and then all, I guess, five, six, seven memorandums so far is viewable on the website as well. <laughs> All right, so just going to jump right in, um, and please stop me at any point if anyone has any questions at all. Um, we'll just keep this as an ongoing discussion rather than jumping through and then discussing after. Um, so first, we'll go through kind of a summary of the phase one proposals, the bike head. Um, so this right here is a copy paste of the bike head proposals from phase one um, that we kind of ended up with. So the three proposals were improvements to three of the four train stations. Um, of course, the one missing is at Leland Road, and I believe VDOT has an ongoing project at that or near that train station for bike head improvements. So 
looking at Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania, and Stafford Brook train station. So first, the Fredericksburg train station um, improves the VCR trail connections is the main point that we're looking at here. And this has been included in past smart trail projects for the project for roundabouts at Kenmore Avenue. Um, you can see that kind of on the left side of the screen to kind of bring the VCR trail onto uh, the, near the train station. Um, and we're really looking to improve train station facilities and improve existing bike racks. Um, so that's kind of one of the main points that Ian has wanted to harp on, and I'll pass it over to him for the next slide here. So, so what Matthew showed you is the alignment of the proposed bike path in the previous slide. That is currently in discussion in a smart scale application. So we don't need to rehash it in the study. The city and VDOT engineers are busy fiddling with those green lines to make sure that it's going to work, to put it in the right place, and all that kind of thing. So it's already underway. The bike racks exist right now at that black square that you can see on the screen. And the next slide shows you a photograph of what they look like. You can see on the left there, quite a lot of people, not in the middle of winter, in the middle of COVID, but quite a lot of people do use those bike racks um, in, in good weather conditions. And, and uh, when the trains are running, when the VRE trains are running, people do bike there, lock up their bike, and they go off to DC or Northern Virginia. What we're suggesting is that those are just two examples on the right of a bike enclosure. To keep the bicycles out of the snow and the rain and the weather, and also provide some better security, I could show you a ton of photographs from Boston where there is a bicycle chained to one of those outdoor racks and the front wheel is gone, right? Um, and I've seen uh, in the middle of winter, snow has fallen, and there's a bike still chained to the bike rack. And both wheels, chains, and everything is gone, and all that's left is the frame because it's slowly been stolen piece by piece by piece as time goes on, right? So apart from the fact that your saddle is wet and the bike may be covered in snow, it could get dismantled by vandals. And so we think that what should happen over time is that this bike facility should be left at the station where it is, but a weatherproof enclosure should be added to it. I know the city has had some difficulty with certain residents who don't want improvements around the station, but really in terms of the people that ride those bikes, they're already there. The bike rack already exists. They're already using it. We just think it should be improved a little to protect those bikes from the weather and from yeah. some potential vandalism that might occur in the future. I'm not sure if the city has had much vandalism here locally, but certainly in Cambridge and Boston, I saw a ton of it. Yeah. Yep. The trains that are going to the station over there, aren't there um, bike blockers or something, bike infrastructure already planned? So VRE. Is sitting right here, so maybe they want to come. Yeah, so we don't directly um, get into this. This is we usually push this onto the locality or you know another entity that that you know is is uh, maintaining the property. But we are 100% in support of this. In fact, we actually were approached um, a couple weeks ago by a private company called Bike Farms. And they were asking us about, um, you know, they did a sales presentation for us. And it was basically an enclosure like that, except it only holds like four bikes at a time, but you could do multiple. Um, bike farms? Bike farms, yeah. Farms. And it's a, it's a Dutch kind of concept where you, you're, it's, a, it's a mobile app access type thing. So you basically subscribe to it and then you have access. Um, but, you know, we, we had to tell them, you know, this is very nice. We definitely support this, but this is really a locality thing. So. Do you know if they charge the locality or if they make their money from the app or do you know how they fund it? It's, it's all custom. So if a locality says this is a service that we want to provide to our residents, to our community public, we're going to provide it for free. They have that option. And then the payment is just tran you know transmitted between the locality and the company. Um, there's also applications where the transit agency will charge a fee or it'll be rolled in 
like a monthly pass for, for transit in places. So we didn't get into all the specifics because it's not something that we would directly do. So they have options, but they manage it then, so nobody else has to get involved they, with the thing. They, they do a, a basically install, manage, and you know, for one fixed fee per year. Build, operate type yeah. system. Yeah. Okay, fine. In the picture on the left, there are um, a few scooters. Yes. Does this plan really address that, or are you? So, so we're we're agnostic in terms of what device you want to ride on, right? If it becomes a serious motorcycle, then it's not going to fit in these racks. But if it's a the little electric scooters, you know, that would fit there. It's not designed for motorcycles. <laughs> Um, but the point is, we just think that the time is right to slowly start doing upgrades at the train station. BRE and DRPT are busy with CSX doing structural upgrades. The smart scale application is busy connecting the bike path, we hope, through the station complex. And we're saying that the extra element that's missing is protecting the bikes from the weather. So, so this is our suggestion. Matt? Right, on to the next slide. Uh, the next one we stopped at Indian train station. Uh, and I'll, I'll just emphasize for each of these three sections, so Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania, and Brook Road, kind of before coming up with this list of recommendations, we spoke with each of the localities to get an idea of what they might be looking for for improvements. Um, so specifically with Spotsylvania, um, looking at a couple of ideas. Of course, you get that east-west mobility with kind of the routing along US-17 from Germana and Hospital Boulevard area to the train station. So US-17 is a major roadway that does not have much bicycle and pedestrian amenities. So that would be a good connection to make. Um, that's the green line going east to west here at the bottom of the image. Um, and then the other one would be kind of following along um, the East Coast Greenway. So the East Coast Greenway is supposed to be a East Coast bike head route that runs um, down through the Fredericksburg region. Um, and it, runs across the Chatham Bridge through the city of Fredericksburg and down Route 2. Um, and this would be one of the potential paths for it, running down Route 2 and then down Benchmark Road along this red option here. And then a couple options to get a specific trail to the train station, and the East Coast Greenway would branch off from there, continuing south in Spotsylvania County and then potentially further into Caroline County. Um, one of the things with Benchmark Road was a study was done in 2012 um, called the Deep Run Trail Study. Um, and this was a study that looked at improving bicycle and pedestrian connections along Route 2 and the Route 2 area and Benchmark Road, and it recommended something like this, some sort of trail along Benchmark Road, maybe in between train tracks and, and the roadway or on the other side of the roadway to bring that bike path connectivity from the Route 2 area, which is an area that has a, a good amount of population, to another area with a good amount of future population, possibly in a train station area. So that would be yeah, just stop there, don't go any further. So is everyone clear the red line is a continuation and a part of the existing Greenway trail that is, sorry, the East Coast Greenway, which is a national U.S. trail already, but it has pieces built and pieces just align on a map. So the, the red line would propose to build that section of the East Coast Greenway to connect into that train station. The green line is our proposal as an east-west mobility measure. South and north of that green line, you have residential neighborhoods. It's a main road, it's the US 17, but it has residential and there's, we spoke to um, Pennsylvania staff and there is a, a number of new residential developments being built south of that green line, closer to the station. And so that that green line would be a way of connecting a bike and pedestrian pathway right to the train station past all of those residential neighborhoods, but could also connect up to the Germana College. So it's a it's another way for Germana to be connected to the train station. Um, on to the next one here. So in Stafford, so the Brook Road train station, um, this is the mostly rural train station without a lot of amenities around it, including utilities. Um, and we would be looking at providing a connection from the Stafford Courthouse area where, a, as Stafford County is calling it, their new downtown they're looking to build. So bringing a lot more residences and employment and commercial opportunities to the Stafford Courthouse area. So we're looking to bring some sort of bike path connection from that area 
down to the Burke Road train station. Um, there's a couple of options that have been discussed. One of those being this upper blue line, option B, which would go along um, Courthouse Road and then down uh, Andrew Travel Road, down to the Burke Road train station. That is the main roadway connection to the train station. So those who use this train station, as we saw in, I guess, memo 3B, um, those who use the train station come from North Stafford generally. Um, and the main way they get there is along Courthouse Road, down Angel Trapper Road, that's the line. So providing a bike head connection down that road um, would make sense. Um, another option is a um, off-road option. Um, option A here, which is the red one, um, would be a path that goes down um, some existing roadways, Old Potomac Church Road, to the utility easement where the power lines are, and then going um, east um, through some wooded areas uh, down to the train station. Um, this is something that's been discussed a lot in the past. Um, it goes through kind of down where the connection splits off, where the two option A split off, the Stafford Civil War Park, so it would make connection to that area. Yeah, question. Now, who nominated Andrew Chapel Road? I did. <laughs> have you been down there lately? I have not, no. It's, it, it's going to be cost prohibitive. Not only right. do you have a constrained overpass, which allows two cars barely to get through, but you have ditches on both sides. I see that as a major engineering cost if you go Andrew Chapel and buy something else. And I'll just point out from, from my perspective, um, as a way of ordering these things, option A is option A for a reason, option B is option B for a reason. So you have four way courses of action is what you're telling me. The, the preferences would be option A, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, it, have you taken a look at the, um, I know this is, Couple years old, but the DC to RVA, the, the the FEIS and the ROD. So because there are some proposed infrastructure modifications to the roads because of the higher speeds that are contemplated, there are some new crossings. Um, and I think that at least when I was at the state, you know, we we didn't we built all of the crossings so as not to preclude bike and ped. So just yeah, make sure if, if uh, you go back and look at those, and, and you know, if, if we've got a, a crossing that's proposed and and that's where you've got your trail or not. That you kind of modify the route to. Certainly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do we have another question? Uh, I'm a little confused. So, according to the agenda, we're going to have this presentation. Then there'll be discussion afterwards, or we're going to have discussion as we go along. I, I, I as we go say along. some things, I hold them, or I bring them up. As we go along, we'll have discussion. Give us your points now. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. All right so, this is an East West mobility study we're talking about. We're talking about. Train stations go north and south. We're talking about making a little access, extra enhanced access to those train stations. Um, we already have, for example, you already said for the Fredericksburg, the first one, the city's already got plans. We've got we got smart scale money we're gonna do. The second one, Spotsylvania, has some plans that they put out according to what was written in the program. The hazard proposed, the East Coast Greenway, which is another north-south thing, will actually feed into that. All right? And then the third one is, you know, some, some routes that would actually it would get pedestrians and it would make it easier for pedestrians and, and, and uh, bicyclists to get to the train station. But we're talking four score and seven people here. I'm looking at a big East-West mobility study. And I think here we're focusing on the little last half mile connections that are already in plans, that, that, that are addressed so, a small number of people. I, why are we wasting, why are we gonna move forward with studying? All these enhancements are wonderful, don't get me wrong. I think they're great enhancements and they're, and they're all things. But so, and some of them, they're so good they're already in plans and already being get some life put. So why don't we just take this part of that study and focus on really big muscle movements for east-west mobility study. We're diluting our efforts if we're gonna we're gonna go down roads like this. We've already spent you know 20 minutes talking about this, and it's inconsequential to the overall study, in my opinion. If I could comment on that, uh, I'm so and, and I don't have any particular insight on this issue specifically, but in general. If you're in a situation where you can't get that half mile, let's say you have to take that your car that half mile but from wherever your station is to wherever your house is, and you might as well drive your car entirely. So it's not impossible that by putting a lot of focus on this on um, access to the transit uh, hubs, that we actually would open up 
Right now, it's just a few people using it, but if we had a much better way to get that, that distance, a whole lot more people might use it. So it might be that these are Just hold on a second, Dave. This is not in anybody's plan. There are one or two small elements that are in existing proposals. The um, Fredericksburg train station, we are simultaneously working on a smart scale application, which is not approved, which is not in a plan yet. It's an application where Mike and I walked it on Friday. We're, we're currently busy doing it. The other two train stations, these are not in anybody's plan. So there are new proposals. And remember at the beginning of the study, we said this is a multimodal study. So there are massive proposals coming. In the study, uh, sorry, in this memo, there are some uh, massive BRT proposals. Plus, our consultants who are waiting to be introduced are going to work on 13 roadways, which are going to produce some very large proposals. So they're all baked in here. Or, trust me, they're, they're baked in. We're just starting with the, the bike once, and he's about to finish. And Ian, just real quick, but I think it'd be great for the group to do the two good comments. Is when we're having these little things like this, is any way to show what kind of uh, what will it take off the roads in the east west? I know that we we spoke about in our first meeting. We targeted all the roads. And maybe it would help everybody understand if we put in a slide like this. If we just put okay, this is going to, we project this to alleviate the congestion on these east-west routes by this amount. And I'm, I'm sure our friends at VSB can help calculate that. But I think this all does tie together, and more connectivity will, will help throughout the region, east-west, north-south. But just by maybe being able to quantify that, it would be a little easier to grasp our, our hands around. It, it's, it's kind of generally, it's all about connectivity. Even if this looks like the small portion, those last mile concerns for everyone, um, is kind of the biggest part. How do you get from, you can get from A to B, but B to B and a half, that's the important part. Now, this is the last slide on Blake Ted, so I will say if, if we want to move on, we can move on from that onto transit. Um, to summary of phase one transit proposals, there's five, six things here. Um, so looking at high capacity BRT, bus rapid transit, um, looking at improved uh, transit connectivity to various stations, looking at a downtown Stafford Transit Center, looking at um, more quicker bus routes from Stafford County to the Central Park, Husband's, Central Park, Spotsylvania Town Center areas, as well as a general understanding of some transit corridors um, that were recommended to us to look at. Um, so we'll hop into this. So, um, so uh, just a quick, this is just a global comment when I was reviewing this before the meeting. Um, can, can we uh, maybe avoid like what they call BRT creep? Where you know we're we're describing a system that you're calling BRT, BRT light, but really there might be very few you know elements of a true BRT system. If if it if it ends up you know through the study that this is a true you know this this really should be a true BRT system, call it that. But I would prefer something more like enhanced bus service or rapid bus service or frequent bus service because when you sell something like BRT and it's not you know, it's it's just not productive. But I mean, I I liked the way that it was laid out and all the routes were analyzed. But I would just caution you against saying that it's going to be BRT. You know, in the in the study document. Uh, not not um, Aiden, but uh, a certain senior person at Fred Transit wants me to go exactly in the opposite direction of what you just okay, said. Okay, that's, so, that's fine. Yeah. I I recognize there's. <laughs> So we've got both opinions, but I, I take your point that we mustn't sell something that's not going to be delivered. I yeah, get that. Yeah. So let's call this a high capacity transit. Matt, carry on. So I'm going to jump into the slide of BRT here. Ian, please interrupt me if there's anything you want to add to this slide particularly. So we tested in a transit software called TBEX. Um, it's a software that basically allows us to do uh, scenario planning and allows us to basically create scenarios for new transit routes. In this instance, we created scenarios for six new DRT routes, as we're calling them. Um, and really through this, we utilized it through various input data sources. So inputs from Fred Transit, their GCFS feeds, um, inputs from the census from DRPT, as well as land use data from the cities and counties from 2020 and 2021. Um, we set all DRT headways as 16 minutes and inputted travel times of 45 minutes. So it takes you from 45 minutes to get from A to B on these routes. Um, as well as service on weekdays that you know, 6.30 to, to 8, 9 p.m. at night, as well as weekends, uh, something that Fred doesn't currently have on the majority of his routes. So at this stage, just a comment, 
these are options, right, to test what happens if you do this. None of these options Matt is going to present is the final proposal. We're only going to get a final proposal after our consultants evaluate the work to date and test it against certain parameters and then make a final proposal. So these are options because they tell us what happens if you implement this? What will the ridership look like? What, what will the effects be? They won't yet tell you whether we have the roadway right-of-way space available to implement a BRT or a high occupancy transit. We will find that out after this. So this is the first step. The first step is if you do this, what happens to the ridership? Does it work? That's what Matt's trying to answer with this section. Yeah, so really we're coming up with and this slide here is describing the scenario that was inputted for all six BRTs. And then the next slide we'll get into all the different kind of route options that could potentially work. Um, on the last part here, um, to kind of next point, TBUS allows us to make BRT specific adjustments. So adding things such as bus only lanes, sheltered transit centers, um, better advertised buses, things like that, that can generally help to increase ridership. Um, so the BRT proposals, um, we have six different proposals here running along kind of major roadways in South of Indian and um, the city of Fredericksburg. So we're looking at uh, upper left here is proposal one, bottom right here is BRT six. So to give you a general idea, um, BRT one runs along Route three through Spotsylvania Town Center as well as um, Central Park and then downtown Fredericksburg through the BRT station and then back up Route three. Uh, BRT2 runs through Route 3, um, and I'll mention these are all South Miss Park and Ride lots. Uh, BRT2 stops at the Salem Church Park and Ride lot, running downtown Fredericksburg and then back up along Fall Hill through Central Park. BRT3 is similar, but instead of running down Route 3, it runs down along Cowan Boulevard. BRT4, again, Salem Church Park and Ride lot. Similar though, it cuts along down to the Mary Washington Hospital Center through downtown Fredericksburg and back up Fall Hill. Uh, BRT5, um, similar to BRT1, is starting at the Gordon Road Park and Ride Lot, um, going through Route 3, downtown Fredericksburg, and instead of going back up Route 3, it cuts back up uh, Cowan Boulevard. And then BRT6, again, cutting down, um, instead of, I'll say BRT6 is very similar to BRT1. The only difference is BRT1 starts at the Gordon Road Park and Ride Lot, BRT6 starts at the Salem Church Park and Ride Lot. So really the general idea was to create general, uh, the inputs, these termini, and many of the points of the stop set are areas of high activity. So looking at park and ride lots, looking at downtown, looking at Central Park, Boston Town Center, um, areas of higher density residences, um, things like that. Yeah. You'll see in the draft memo that the attempt here is to connect Pennsylvania Town Center Shopping Mall and District, the cinemas and all that, Central Park, all the shopping district there, the University of Mary Washington for students and staff, the train station for connection to VRE, and in some cases we looked at connecting the hospital in as well. On the very west, we toyed with these two park and ride lots, which don't currently have great bus service or sometimes no bus service at all. So we looked at what if we started to connect one or both of those park and ride lots into the system. So those are the high points that we tried to hit. We're trying to connect and, and in between residential neighborhoods so we have the ridership. So you're trying to connect residential areas downtown with the two shopping districts, the university, the train station, and perhaps the hospital. So those are the points you're trying to hit. And in doing so, we're trying to model where we're going to get the best ridership. And is it even feasible? That's where we're going. Just one quick question with the, with the BRT, well, more of a comment. So I think these are I think these are really good start. When you do BRT, you really have to have it as straight as possible. Mm -hmm. So I think that some of these ideas that we have, um, I'm looking at BRT for, they're looping. This, this wouldn't be successful for BRT. BRT the option when we're going through option one, five, and six are the are good. Except when you go down to the city of Loops and they all both have appendages off of it. I think what is a five that goes around the corner. What a successful BRT will be really point to point. You can't hit all of them. You can hit as many as you can, but you can also have some BRT 
stations that can act as transfer points mm -hmm. for other routes. So if you want to go ahead and try to, if, you, if you're looking at a BRT as a trunk of your system, which I think is what would what you're getting at and what would probably work best here, if you're looking for a 15-minute frequency service, like you said, then with the, if you want to have some of these other big locations um, that aren't necessarily on that east-west line, you might want to have a route that's 30 minutes, 15 minutes that connects still so you can transfer into the BRT. So I, I, I think that you know, this might need a little more polishing up on just trying to get linear because this, I, I don't think this would um, work too well with the BRT. This could be, you know, uh, I think the quarters are good, but I, I think just maybe one or two more iterations we'll, we'll, we'll get there, but we just got to focus on keeping it as linear as possible so we can get those speeds down. So we, that happens, for example, when you're trying to include the hospital, right? So that's why a lot of those options just don't include the hospital because it's kind of out of the way. Also, as you'll see, if you look in the memo and you look further at the data, the, mo the most obvious linear route is just straight down route three, but it doesn't have the highest ridership. So the attempt here is to trade off ridership versus keeping it as a linear thing. And in fact, a straight line down route three does not actually do what you're saying is to produce the best ridership and the most successful route, unless the model is just bad. But the model shows that places like Cowan Boulevard, that's where you're going to get your most ridership. And then the final thing I'll say before I'll shut up and hand over to the rest of you is the problem is, of course, finding the right of way to be able to build a bus lane. And if you keep it in a straight linear line, you've got to find it right away on both sides of the road which stretches your ability to fit it in to the maximum, right? If you're able to get two parallel roads, you can put one way on the one and the other way on the other one, at least then you need less right of way on each road to be able to put the lane in. So I understand the point that you're making. There are, it, there are a balance of forces here that we're trying to look at to try and make it actually be successful. I understand, I think you can get there. But you, when, you, when you get into the middle, you have to have it bi-directional or people aren't going to ride as much. So if you have it on two parallel roads, it's not going to have as high as ridership as just having it there. Which, and when I say linear, I mean it needs to be in a straight line. So if you wanted to, just by looking at it, you could kind of do a hybrid if you wanted to, what, Route 3 through Central Park up to Falkwell Avenue. You're still just going on one right-of-way bi-directional. You could do a little bit of a loop at the end, but I would really only keep it a couple blocks. Um, I, and I'm, I'm no BRT expert, I'm sure, when you get to the engineering and get into, into, into the risk of it. But those are the, the basic concepts. I, that's why I, I really think that BRT 1 and BRT 5 and 6 here are really good starting points because they're not branching out so far and they're not looping. You do have a little bit of tension on 5. I think this is going the right direction, but just those, 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 two, those two concepts, keeping it linear and then making sure that you have it always bi-directional on the same road. I know there are right-of-way um, you know, difficulties here, but it may, it may show that a BRT is not feasible at this time. Well, so let me just uh, interject here a little bit. Um, yeah. <clears throat> looking at your model and your numbers, I think you're right on. Uh, four and three hit our transit quarters where our people are. Uh, the, the one, I understand what you're saying, Aiden, completely, but one and six, that's a that segment of Route Three in the city. It's not essentially. It's not a dead zone, but it's not a transit zone. It's it's low density commercial use. There's a few neighborhoods there. Uh, it's not serving our transit population, and that's why the numbers are higher on the model than the other one. So, if it needs to be more linear and more direct and, and two way, I think that's a great insight. I'd agree, but I would focus on Cowan and Fall Hill. It's where. Uh, our land use planning indicated that we needed these types of routes because that's where our service is. And I agree wholeheartedly. I think Cowan and Fall Hill are the two quarters to, to, to go on. Um, you just can't have all these different appendages. I, I hear you, man. That's a good point, especially the two-way thing. I think yeah. That makes a ton so, of sense. so yeah, Fall Hill and Cowan Boulevard. I mean, those, those are those are going to win you the win you the medal. And, and the numbers are in here. I yeah. thought this was an excellent report. The way it's, it's laid out, like you were suggesting before, showing how the ridership works. It's in the tables and. And that's, I mean, I can, I can see it on the map and I can see it in here. It, so it, it's fantastic, but you have, but when, you, when you're looking at the model, you really have to also uh, go over some of the intangibles, which is, it, is this going to be useful to somebody on the ground? And if you don't have it where you can ride, because when you're going in a loop or when you're going off all these ways, it's not a direct shot. So you really have to keep it linear. And I, I don't know, I'm not 
totally familiar with PBEF to tell you, but I don't know how um, it, it calculates that, but um, bi-directional, linear, go down Fall Hill, go down Cowan, um, I think that's really where you're gonna, where we're gonna win here. Yeah, yeah one thing I might recommend you all look at is, um, I think what they call like an open BRT, where in a trunk, you, you basically have a BRT-like headway structure. But once you get to a point where the routes need to fan out because they have to serve the hospital and the shopping mall and this, then they start to fan out. And so customers are starting on one end, choosing their you know origination, choosing their destination, and uh, and the customers that are that are taking it in the highest density, most transit you know supportive part of the corridor can get on any bus because the headway is five, ten, fifteen minutes or whatever. And so I, I feel like for a Fredericksburg example, that might work better here, you know, or at least to look at it and just put it into TBEST and see, take some of the existing Fred routes, route them into one or two main corridors and then route them back out. And, you know, and you can still have the branding and all that kind of stuff, but it's, you know, I think it's, yeah, I, I mean, I kind of agree with what you're saying. It just, it's, it's, it needs to be more linear. So what you're saying is the center must have a straight line bi-directional yeah. and then some feeder catch on either side that yeah. could branch out. But that doesn't necessarily need to be BRT. It could just be high frequent bus service. So because yeah. if we if we start having ten minutes there, there's no room to afford it. Yeah. But if we have fifteen to ten minute headways down Fall Hill, down Cowan, and then we have the way that we would organize our routes would use those particular BRT stations. Like let's say there's one close to the hospital on Fall Hill. We have a route thirty minutes. You can connect to the BRT, and they use, you use those stations as transfer hubs. I mean, that's a, kind of the the, the cost-effective model that more agencies are getting to now. Keeping one BRT to start, and then you're using your stations as transfer centers. Yeah. Right. So, so what you're saying, these are not currently Fred bus routes that would be enhanced by having a dedicated right. lane and that sort of thing. Right. These are our routes that we drew up. Okay, the so then the obvious question to me is, VRA's been doing this for a long time. If there's no demand signal for these routes, I mean, apparently there isn't because we don't have them now. So what's the new demand signal? V VR, VRA does not do BRT routes. They're I'm sorry, Fred. I'm sorry, I said VRA. I said Fred. Excuse me, Fred. Sorry. So the transit does not currently service these. So the demand signal is not there. There's high priorities. So Fred, we service all of these areas. The, the issue is with our routes that haven't been really comprehensively looked at since 1996. Our routes are horrible. They all go in circles and they all go off everywhere. I think what they're just proposing is is what we really right. have successfully. So you have to, you're system. about to undertake a new transit study, right? Oh, we are. We are. We're, right. we're, we're so, locking that off. So is not this the kind of thing they should address? Yeah. So this is what so they're. Should this that I'm proposing? We throw these options over them and let them address it. It's a, again, something's going to take away from the bigger, the, the more purposeful project uh, of this uh, purpose of study, which is East West Mobility Study. Yeah, I would so respect the experts I, in their I, greater I, study I, I'm on sorry. the transit of the VRE. I got I, uh, Fred Trans. I, I disagree with you there. Um, I, I represent the university here, and I know that students right now, they don't know that there's a way to get around. Uh, and uh, the the Fred has not really been in the very much. Um, this, if it uh, works, would be hugely helpful for students and the uh, UMW community. So I, I understand that it maybe does not affect quite as many people as you know, heart travel, but it's important too. And just to address your point, saying, but it belongs to another study. I, yeah, well, I can, I can clear, I clear as everybody right now. So we have a different study, right? But the study is focused on how we can actually route our buses, right? So it's going to focus on, yes. Yeah, so this is more of a BRT. This is more of a no. This is different. This is more of a construction base. This is more. It's not really aspirational. This is more solid. There's a lot of fun. This is more for the construction part of it as well. So you're when you have a BRT, there's a lot of different capitalizers that you need. We're doing more operational stuff when we take a look at our routes. What we're going to be doing in our study is saying, okay, these are the routes that we come up with. These are different quarters. I think what we're doing here is really getting on the construction side of it of how, where the station is going to go and how are we going to, you know, fit that in with the different sort of roadway improvements. Is it actually worth it? They're going to be studying that because if we've been talking in the last three meetings, last week about focusing on specific areas. So we need to know what area is best 
for this heavier construction, and that's going to accompany it into the stuff that we're doing alone in this. So we really need this part in there so we don't go ahead and have something that's completely different, and I really think they're going to feed well together. It's, it, it's, it, it's tackling a similar concept, but it, this is more on the capital side, or this is what we're doing is more on where people are going and how we get them quickly. So I hope that kind of clears it up a little bit. So, so Aiden is in charge of the, the transit strategic plan of Fred, and he's drawing up the scope of that study and, and, and running it. For that reason, you will see that the other transit proposals that we're making later on in this presentation, we're not making any final conclusions. We're saying these are corridors that should have transit, and we're giving the numbers for Fred to take and build into their study. This one project plus a transit center in Stafford that we're looking at are part of this study. The other routes of where to run buses, we're leaving that up to Fred, but Fred asked us if we could run some numbers for them, some data, so that they have the data to include in their study, which you will see in maps, maps that are coming now. We're doing two big bangs. This proposed BRT, it may require bus lanes, which will mean dealing with right away, and we have people here who are experts in that to look at that. What are the possibilities? What are the costs involved in that? And a new transit center in Stafford, which also Fred is not going to construct. So those two big things we're dealing with, the other data we're handing over to Fred as suggestions for them in their TSP, which they can follow up further. And last question. I do want to respect everyone's time and, and move on. Yeah, we do need to move Capital lesson. So I noticed that um, most of these paths actually don't go back through Fred Central. Are, are BRT routes expected to go through some common depot? If, so, if, I mean, if you look at number two and four and five, they do actually go through Fred Central. Yeah. So the ones on Capitol okay, so Boulevard do, more than that. and to answer you the second part of that, you really you don't necessarily have to. I mean, if, if we run a, a BRT down Fallsville Avenue and say instead of Capitol Boulevard, that's when the you know you'd have a train. You'd have you you'd probably want to have a. Uh, I'm guessing on Route One or maybe somewhere more. I can't think off the top of my head where it'd be. Maybe off of your Mary Washington Boulevard, but Fred Central would be a great place to have one of those routes that you can just get right into the BRT with. So you can get on Fred Central. Bus goes every half hour, and bam, you're right there on the BRT. Then you have access to, you know, you have access to a, a wide variety of areas and locations that Ian mentioned within 15 minutes, 10 minutes. You know, if you have the frequency and the speed that they're they're proposing and trying to bring up here. So if it, also, just real quick, our, our our transfer center is not that great because it's made for Greyhound for Northwest travel. So east west in there is difficult, and um, you know, I'd be curious how we really tackle that problem. But yeah, I, I don't think necessarily have to, but obviously with our hub and spoke model now, that's where all that activity goes. But BRT gives you a lot more flexibility when it comes to how you make your routes. Okay. It seems to me that, you know, relocating the hub of the BRT system to the train station, that way you kind of maximize your mobility out from that central. Everyone, that would be good to consider. consider. Yeah. So every, every one of those six go through the train station. Yeah. So we've, we've yeah, we've, that's great. Right. Right. Matt, move on. Moving on, um, the results of the DRT proposals. Um, looking at this, um, we noticed that the ones along Route 3, as we were talking about, are have, have the lower ridership. One, you know, five and six have the lower ridership, while the ones that went through, you know, downtown, through Fall Hill, through Town Boulevard, as Mike was speaking about, um, they're the ones with the higher ridership that the model output is. Um, so we're generally looking at the places with the higher residential density um, as, as ones that potentially have a good idea for, for BRT. So we've learned a whole lot from doing this study. The first thing we learned is that if you want your ridership to go up, you need to hit the residential densities, not the business densities. So you have to, whichever route you choose, you have to hit a couple of areas of high residential density in order to make this successful, because the business densities don't drive up the ridership numbers enough without connecting to those high residential densities. That we've learned from this. That's what those numbers tell us. Also, the one drawdown that we've, or one, one negative that we found with the TVET modeling software, and there may be a fiddle that we haven't worked out, but it does not add 
riders for the two park and ride lots. It treats them like a normal bus stop. Mm. And so there may be a fiddle that we've missed in the system, but we can't find it. We can't find it in the documentation. So, so those two, the, the, those routes that do connect all the way out to the B dots park and ride lot, yeah, they will add, if the bus goes there, if the BRT goes there, they will add riders. We just don't know how many because the TBET thing won't tell us that piece of information right now. There might be an add-on or something that we've missed, but it is a weakness in the TBET model that we can't find it. So that's the one caveat. But otherwise, those numbers tell you that you should connect your business with residential areas to get the ridership to go up, and that's why Cowan Boulevard, far and above everything else, pushes up the ridership. If you want to put a route, at least one leg should go on Cowan Boulevard because it's going to push up the ridership of that old system. Okay. Unless, unless you link it to a regular bus route that Fred puts every 30 minutes or something. I apologize. This is one point just so we have context. This estimated cost is like about 20% of our operating budget, just so everybody knows how important it is to really get this stuff right. So, yeah. I mean, it's, do, it's definitely doable for us. We have money that we can use for operating now with the new stuff in the federal government. But, yeah, I mean, this would be... Um, extremely good for transit in the region, but we got to make sure that we, 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 we get this one right. Also, there's tons of infrastructure that would have to be built, Absolutely. and that, that has a cost, and there are new starts programs, and there are all sorts of other programs. We can't get into every little detail because you'd be here for another hour, but, but this is the major takeaways are make sure you get the high residential areas on your bus routes. That's what makes this work. Um, from VRA's perspective, I think there's a lot of value we see in creating a system where a customer has the option to take the train only in one direction and to come back into the region in a different way. And to be able to, if they're going to start their, their journey by transit, let's say they, they want to park at the, v, uh, the VDOT park and ride, they want to carpool up, you know, because they've got a friend that's going into town, but that friend's not coming back at the same time they are, they want to get back on the BRE to be able to connect. So I think what you're you know, what you've got planned, you know, have, having the train station. I mean, it, it seems like today in the, in the COVID times, very low ridership, you might be tempted to say, well, do we really need to serve the station? I would highly recommend keeping that station in there because you start to create some add-on effects when, you know, for, for one-way travel, for people just coming into the region, just going out of the region. So, so the idea, I agree with you. The idea here is to try and do two things with a BRT at the same time. The one is to connect the business areas locally with, with the residential areas locally. The other one is to get people Facilitate from the, the western, regional. which is why it's an east-west route, right? Yeah. To get people from the western part of our localities down to the train station mm -hmm. and to the rest of the Fred system so that they can connect to Stafford or they can connect to DC. Mm -hmm. so, so you're building the east-west link to connect all these other things that makes it a multimodal yeah. system that actually works as a system. Yeah, and I think just one more quick point. It wouldn't make sense to study transit in an east-west mobility study if you didn't include – the whole point of this is to get people off the roads and by getting people – To connect. To connect over to it. So, I, I mean, the, the, obviously, the, the, the downtown train stage for us is a big priority, and I think I, any transit portion in this needs to incorporate, obviously, and I think that's something that the team is all aware of. Yeah. Good. Matt? All right, moving on. Um, improved transit connectivity to VRE stations. Um, so you guys remember from the last memo, we did VRE catchment areas for all the VRE stations. Um, we got some data from VRE from a survey they did and calculated catchment areas. I basically overlapped over those, um, generally defining corridors where, say, VRE routes that go specifically to the VRE station run along that could pick up ridership from, say, park and ride lots. Um, so, You'll see the other stations in the memo, um, just shown here is Brook Road, um, just a couple of major corridors that run through there where a VRE feeder route could run along. Matt, just flip through the, so, okay. Have you separated up one of the VRE stations and not done all the others? Yeah, this is okay, great. the other ones are in the memo. All right, thanks. Before we go to the Stafford Transit Center, because I think there will be some discussion on that, um, I'll guess today are the new consultants with um, VHB. They have another meeting to get to after this one, so I'd like to just break for five minutes before we do the transit center and introduce them to you if that's okay. Uh, otherwise, they're going to miss their following meeting. Is that okay? So VHB, the policy committee, has uh, 
with our advice chosen for the phase two of this study. And that involves all the engineering work, right? Plus uh, refining proposals that we're making in this phase one and turning them into formal proposals, which we will then put to our jurisdictions and the policy committee and the TAC and, and everything else. So they will be starting work, I would say, at the end of the month. Um, and we're going to introduce them. So the company is VHV. They have many years in this industry. They're going to introduce themselves. I've got Chris Daly over here, who's the program manager. And I've got Drew um, Morrison, who is the deputy program manager. And they're going to be managing their team of people, including engineers, including planners, including statistical people, who are going to take phase one through phase two for us and turn that into formal proposals, including all the roadway projects, which I know Dave has been asking about. So phase one will complete most of the transit work, but without any right-of-way engineering. And they're going to review that, plus do some right-of-way work. And they're then going to tackle those 13 roadway corridors for us. So I'm going to allow you to introduce yourself, because I know you have to move to another meeting. So. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate you breaking up. Why don't you stand up? Uh, sure thing. Great. Sure thing. Uh, thank you all. Uh, this has been a great, lively conversation. I appreciate getting an opportunity to get a little head start and take part in this meeting. Uh, a lot of great work has been done, obviously taking in contributions from this stakeholder group, many of whom I think are part of our pipeline studies. I see Stephen over there, so you might recognize my name and voice if you're on those meetings uh, where we're, we're doing uh, studies of several corridors in Spotsylvania, Fredericksburg, Stafford County. Uh, so this is a great extension of that work. That one focused on corridor mobility. This, of course, focused on the broader east-west mobility, as Dave was pointing out. Uh, you know, it's, it, we're, we're really trying to take what this great work that's been done already and, and extrapolate upon it, do some of that follow-up modeling, the fiddling, as you mentioned, um, but also thinking about it from an engineering perspective. As you said, where is the right of way available to do some of these uh, great concepts in, in theory? How do we actually make them work? So again, my name is Chris Daly. I'm the project manager as well as this uh, program manager for the broader contract. The project manager of this study, along with my lieutenant Drew, I've been with BHB my entire career. Prior to that, I actually came from a firm, BMISG. Some of you with the gray hair might remember that firm, BMISG, and uh, Frank Spielberg, and some of the uh, the COD uh, folks that um, also had some opportunity back in the Lloyd days of, of working with this group as well. And uh, I'm very focused on I-95, north south, right? And now we really need to bring it back to how do we get our folks you know, connected to the, you know, residential with our train stations, et cetera, and not forgetting that last half mile. Very important. It's, it's a balance of all of our modes, and that's exactly why we're here to, to help uh, this group take it to that next step. And uh, Drew Orison, I'm a planner um, and work with Chris on a number of projects throughout the region, and I bring a particular perspective in, in transit planning, particularly around suburban and exurban jurisdictions, so it's really excited to bring some of those lessons learned from places that look a lot like this and understand how we, can we fit transit into the spatial context that we're talking about. So really excited to work with Chris on this range of strategies from the road to the transit and work with all of you over the next few months. And if you want to know who the guys are that are, read, that are designing the expanded future um, Union Station in DC, you're looking at them. Uh, and they've also worked on other BRT projects which are much further along than, than what, where we are with a high-level proposal at this stage. So they've done BRT, they've done train stations, They've done the highways. They're busy with BDOT doing pipeline studies up and down the region. So they come with a lot of expertise, which I'm um, looking forward to benefiting from, not least of all because my data expert is uh, leaving us at the end of, end of today. So we're, you've come just at the right time. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you very I, I much. Sit, I sit in Richmond right now, formerly Tyson Corps my whole career. So it's been Lively discussion about the BRT. You know, I'm thinking about our BRT <laughs> in Richmond, and you're absolutely right with the linear. And the, so this is a great conversation, like you like said, bringing a lot of perspective from some of our neighboring regions uh, to the Frederick area. Thanks for coming today. I know this is not formally part of your work. You just came to introduce yourself, but we appreciate working with you, and we look forward to getting some exciting projects bankable. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much. All right, moving along um, down to the downtown Stafford Transit Center. So this plan, on the right side of the image, is from the Stafford Comprehensive Plan. Um, so it's a general idea of what they may want to go for with their Stafford downtown. Um, you'll notice on the screen, um, on the upper left here, is um, the Stafford Courthouse interchange. And up to the upper right, outside of this image, is the Stafford Courthouse. Um, so we're really looking at places where you could build a transit center. Of course, there is the existing park and ride lot that was built, the new park and ride lot built by VDOT. Um, and there is some transit improvements right where the number one is associated here. Um, so that could potentially be improved to build a better transit center um, that's capable of better buses. Um, or you could build other options such as kind of two, three, and four here in and around the Stafford Courthouse area where um, a transit center that can connect Fred Transit, that can connect Omniride commuter bus to North Virginia, can, can connect Fred Transit to the VRE stations, or road VRE stations in the open, um, things like that. So. No questions, I will move on to the next one. Um, so Stafford County Express Bus, as we're calling it, um, not a BRT, not necessarily too much quicker than a regular Fred route, but something that hopefully gets people in Stafford County from you know, the US 17 core or the Leland area to um, Spotsylvania Town Center to Central Park quicker than say the current bus routes do. This idea was suggested to us by, where have you gone? By, um, a member of your CTEC during one of your CTEC meetings. So we actually took the idea and we said, well, can it work? What would it look like? So I have two route options here, a C route, as we're calling it, and an S route, and you'll see why those are named C and S. Um, again, use TBEST, but not B or T options, so just 60 minute headways, but we did include weekend service. So the C route on the left here, it's a backwards C, um, going through US 17, down I-95 to Central Park, to South Virginia Town Center, to Route 3. Uh, and then the S route, kind of a sideways S, if you get what I'm saying here. Um, route 3 corridor, Central Park, Town Boulevard, downtown Fredericksburg, and then up to kind of the White Oak area, the Brook Road, Route 218 area in Stafford County. So you have two different options here, um, just basic Fred routes. Um, that we can see some ridership statistics for. Um, they are generally lower than most spread routes, they're kind of below average, um, but certainly gives a good idea of what could be possible. And the answer to the question that was posed to us at CTEC, what about having this express bus with limited stops connecting Stafford with um, the shopping districts in, in Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania? The answer is there. The answer is it's not a great number of riders that would likely use the service. So it's it's it can be built, but it's not going to be you're not going to get hundreds of thousands of people doing that. Is that primarily because of the headways, or is it because you just the number of stops just isn't that great, so the concentration of people getting on and off has to be? It's a, it's a variety of everything. Okay. You know, the land use, you know, you're looking at, at US 17, a light to Route Three is is a yeah. commercial land use where the residences are not right on the roadway. They're not okay. the residences right on the roadway. Okay. So. Uh, that's kind of the main reason I think it's a limit. Again, to make it successful, you have to do a lot of fiddling because mm -hmm. just I'm, a straight route like that, it just doesn't. With all of this, as Aiden mentioned earlier, we're looking at this in conjunction with, on the other parts of the screen, you see all these lines, those are other FRED routes. So we're looking at this in conjunction with the rest of the FRED system. So if you completely redo the FRED system, like maybe the TSB will be looking at, then maybe you might be able to also increase ridership on some of these other route proposals as well. Increasing those transfers, increasing those um, better access to the residents. But we thought we should at least run the numbers, seeing as it was suggested to us. They're the numbers, they're not great numbers. Um, and then the last one, um, east-west corridors. This is just a general look at our corridors, um, our east-west corridors, some of the major ones uh, that were suggested to us at the last stakeholder meeting. So Town Boulevard, Fall Hill, Route 3, both courthouse roads in Stafford and Spotsylvania County, uh, Warrington Road, US 17, and then Garrison Road, Garrisonville Road, Route 610. So we have a mixture of roadways in all three localities. Um, similar to the TVS and the Stafford Express, different, the 30 minute headways instead of 60 minutes. Not for any more reason of running more buses, but literally these routes are shorter. So you can run one bus in, in 30 minutes and, and be fine. Um, but again, weekday, weekend service. And these are all of them. Um, again, you all know where the corridors generally are. So this is, you know, those exact same corridors, you know. And just before you move off of this, sorry to interrupt you, Matt, but these are not bus routes, right? Uh, 
spread out just to just look at some corridors and what potential ridership on those corridors are, they're going to follow up with this in their study. So we're not doing any more work after today on these particular ones. These are just to assist Fred by looking at are these corridors, major corridors, do they have a ridership in the vicinity that could be used? And then Fred can take that information and use it or not use it. We just assisted them by doing these. The purpose was to get some transit-like numbers for all these corridors to get an idea of what could work for future transit services. So they're not, you know, planned nice routes or anything. They just have a logical termini at a, at a um, shopping center, at Fred Transit, for instance. Uh, but that's, that's about it. We really appreciate you guys doing this because, you know, when we took a look at it, what we really wanted to get was, can we rank the east-west corridors in our region so we can prioritize where we put our more frequent headways? So the, all the information you have is just fantastic. And uh, yeah, it's going to help us a lot when we're really trying to uh, where we allocate our resources. And there, there are the numbers. Matt will walk you through them and then we'll take your question. Can you go back to that last slide? Is there a reason why the interior east-west routes in downtown Fredericksburg aren't considered in these lines? I mean, these look like suburban Are you talking about like William Street or something? William Street is a good example. Or even, uh, I would say that Caroline Street is in east-west because it connects, yeah. if, you, if you run it out, kind of more up to Fall Hill so Avenue. It was really just trying to choose the major, the major rivers in the region. Uh, um, so uh, the other answer is because Fred asked us to look at these specific ones. Yeah. And I, I okay. remember in the, with the first or two first two meetings, we all identified the quarters we looked at. So I think they just looked at quarters that we identified in the meeting. Correct. Yeah. Got it. Thanks. So the specific data, um, really, as we mentioned throughout this whole meeting, Town Boulevard, Fall Hill, Route Three actually has quite a bit of good ridership, but Town Boulevard is that top that top annual ridership number. That is where you have the densest amount of people as well as a lot of people who can then connect to Central Park. So you have Central Park and density, um, you know, you think you have a bigger shopping center in Fredericksburg and you have the most density in Fredericksburg all in the same ground. So that's where you're getting the most of it. Um, you, other, Matt is quite correct. It's the same thing we found on the BRT. Those top three, those are where the riders are. Those other ones, they're interesting, but they have less riders. So you can see here, you know, Route 3 does have ridership, and that is why we did run a BRT along it, but it doesn't have as much as, say, Town Boulevard does. And just one quick distinction, I think, for the group is these will be, because we keep getting the question of, okay, these aren't the big, broad, macro, east-west. We're only good, transit will only be able to solve some of these corridors. So I think by, you know, looking at these ones, we can say as a group, okay, this is where transit would be helpful to solve the congestion, mm -hmm. Cal and Fall Hill, Route 3, maybe a little bit of Garrisonville Road, but the other ones we can just throw out. So that's where, you know, I think we could come into play. We won't have anything else to do with what else you all decide about the other ones that don't really, you know, nothing we can really do about it from our perspective. Good. Moving on, next steps, Ian. Good. So this is where we are today. This is the first time we've presented you with ridership numbers that can give us some guidance as to what could happen and what really shouldn't happen because it's a really bad idea. And we can see already we're starting to now form patterns of if we're going to do a BRT light or whatever the hell we end up wanting to call it, the high capacity transit route. We now know where not to put it. And we've also got some idea of where to put it. And Cowan Boulevard, on every single run we've done, whether it's a regular bus route or whether it's a high capacity route or a full BRT route, that roadway attracts the highest ridership. And if you want full buses, you need to have something there that is connected to the shops, that is connected to the university, to downtown, to whatever. That would always be number one. And then Fall Hill and Route 3 also provide a significant amount of ridership. But you can see that depending on how you lay that on the ground, it can have great ridership or mediocre ridership or none at all. And one thing and I want to add to that, within the actual memo, for all of these routes, we've detailed the amount of percentage minority population, the percentage low-income population, the density of residents, the density of employment, and that can help also help give you a really good idea more than just the ridership numbers of why these routes, why these, I guess, corridors are better than others. And we spent a very, very long time checking data, validating data with the jurisdictions. So we spent a long time going to your planning departments and saying, hey, can we please get your latest number of housing units per, per literally, Matt was doing it per stand, per, per 
land parcel. I went parcel by parcel for a month. So he literally went parcel by parcel to verify how many dwelling units on that parcel. We did a major data um, analysis before running these numbers. So by the time we did this, we have confidence that the data that we have in that TVS right now for number of housing units and number of people is very accurate compared with some of the other models that are around for our region. Now, it's still not 100% perfect. In the very rural areas where we don't have transit and we're not likely to have transit, I'm not going to vouch for the data in the very, very rural parts of the model. But certainly in all the moderately urban and very urban parts of our jurisdictions, the data in this model are, are very accurate. So I think this is giving us a better idea than we've ever had before as to where successful high capacity transit could go and also where we're recommending bike and pedestrian access to transit. Phase two is going to also look at other bike and ped which are not necessarily directly connected to transit, such as you know, connecting through the shopping district, a bike path, a bike and pedestrian path, and, and those other things. This specifically looked at bike and ped connected to transit, where we could try to get people to train stations and key bus uh, stops, plus these transit um, proposals. It looks like at this stage a single BRT light or high capacity transit system would be viable, but you'd have to spend some time, and we'd like to work with our consultants to find exactly where the best route would be. Those are options that we put there, and we've looked at where the ridership would be. We certainly know where it won't work, a bunch of places it won't work, and we also know a couple of places where it's likely to work quite well, but then if we want to make some BRT infrastructure like dedicated bus lanes, where would we put that? Would there be enough right of way? Would it be fundable? Would it actually even work? We can't ask that question yet. We're not asking you to support that answer yet because we don't know the answer to that yet. What we know is where the riders are. We don't know where the land is available. And that's the second uh, part of this equation. So any comments from anybody on how far we are with this so far? We'd happily take your last comments. I'm conscious of the time, but this has been the shortest meeting if we stop right now. <laughs> So well, I'll prolong it just a little bit longer if that's okay. Um, how did how did you choose the um, span of service? Because it seemed when I was reading the report, it seemed kind of arbitrary. And like on the weekends, when you would think yeah. people are out at the mall, people are you know six thirty, seven seven o'clock or whatever it was, it seemed kind of early. Uh, the weekends, of course, were I think yeah. six a.m. till eight or nine p.m. Okay. Um, so that's just your basic weekday service. Um, a little bit longer than what Fred runs. Fred starts at what, 6.30 and ends at 7.30, 8.30, something like that. Okay. So it's that and a little bit longer than what Fred runs. Um, the weekend service was, yeah, that was a little bit of a conversation. Um, the weekends, I think we have, what, 8 a.m. until 9 p.m. on Saturdays mm -hmm. to get those people who are shopping during the day as well as a little bit of the people who are going out in the evening. Um, that certainly could be expanded to a little bit later in the day for a specific route. If you have a Fred route that goes you have a Fred route. Um, for instance, the Eagle Express route, yeah. um, they run until midnight, Aiden? Um, no. We, we, so it, you, we used to have the Eagle late night that did run there, right. but now we, we, we end around 9 or 10, end around nine or 10. depending okay. on the day. Yeah. And this is all based on funding. We don't run Sunday service right now except for the Eagle. Yeah. So we, okay. we work with FAMPO to try to figure out you know, what's our span of service now. And then you know, we, we're, we're bringing Saturday service on board. So they, yeah. That that can all change, but I wanted to give Matthew yeah. some uh, um, metrics that were in tune with what we already run, so we yeah. can compare apples to apples. Because two things I'll say, like one, like as we're as we're already starting to contemplate weekend service, reverse yeah. flow service, all day service, the success of our service will depend on exactly. your span of service, in, in not not literally yours, but you in, know, in T best we included the yeah. Right. Okay. The input of the VRE route, I won't say it's perfect. Um, I don't have data okay. from Virginia or any of that kind of stuff, but I won't yeah. say it's perfect. But we do get transfers in the mornings and the afternoons okay. up yeah. to the VRE route. Existing. We're not yeah. patching yeah. yeah. the 5 a.m., of course. Right. We are patching those 7 a.m., those 8 a.m., right. yeah. those 2, 3, 4, 5 p.m. And just FYI, I mean, we're, we're, when 
what we're trying to do is, is make the threat system go seamlessly into VR, especially when you guys do bidirectional service yeah. every half hour. So, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to plan our schedules directly based on yours and yeah. whoever else that we connect with. Yeah. So that plan of service is like Fred plus some. Mm -hmm. But, of course, when we get to actually implementing something, then we'd have to work with Fred, who presumably would be the operator, unless you guys want to operate it. <laughs> but we're the operators. We'd have to work with you to to look at kind of when are they likely to have riders available, right? Right, right? So on a Sunday, you typically have less riders, so yeah. you might want to have a shorter span of service. But this is this is a real as real as you can get with CVEST and and modeling example of what would likely happen. But you need it extend or reduce that based on funding, based on yeah. where VRE trains. I mean, if there are no VRE trains on Sunday, then that's not even a consideration for right. the Sunday span of service. I, I think you just need to take a workforce first approach to looking at the span of service because if, if the stores close at 7, which means the workers are done by 7.30 or 8, but the bus stops running at 6, you know, they're not going to take that first trip in the morning sure. and, then you, and then you lose two trips, you know. So, I mean, sure. that's, who, that's who this service is going to is going to benefit is the people going to work at the Target, at the Walmart, you know, and so forth. Yeah, it's all about your timing. So generally yeah. what we do for now is putting the general idea into DBS, yeah. get some outputs, and after, uh, of course, you those details are the most important part of that mm -hmm. schedule. Mm -hmm. um, what was like the walk distance that you assumed people would, would walk to get to a stop? I believe it was a quarter mile or a half mile in DBS. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Now, one thing I noticed is we're doing CMT 2021 now, or 2021, is that right? Yeah. Correct. And there's a lot of data and stuff in there that's applicable to both phase one and phase two of this effort. And I hope those get, you know, those cross breeds. The, the roadway numbers, uh, yeah. Some valuable stuff. Um, so, and one other thing, Ian said he always puts a typo in every diamond. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wrote this memo solely. <laughs> It's, it's VCR. I just saw this thing. VCR is it? Is it uh, railroad or roadway? Or I mean, Rail, railway or railroad? I saw this. Railway. Oh. Railway oh. is the. No, I saw this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think they wrote railroad in here. So there's two places. <laughs> it speaks to the Virginia Central Railroad as a history of the Virginia Central. Okay. Railroad. As long as we got it right, I don't know. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'll check it. I just thought something. I, said, I never knew that. There's, it does now, say both of those in two different places. Yeah. yeah I, so I never do that anyway. So and then my so my so my other all my comments so far have been I looked at this from a bigger perspective and I'm not I'm not denigrating any of the issues you know the, the, the bike pad and that it, you know but there, in a lot of cases it's, it's the last quarter mile it's well identified there's already money, you know money put towards it already planned already done so I'm saying is any of those things that we can take out of the study or put lesser attention on because there's so much more big muscle movements that got to be done. That's all I'm trying to do is can we simplify this so the, con the contractors are really concentrate on this stuff. It's really going to have the most impact, the most value added to it. So, so yeah. that was my perspective. And and you'll know, it's, well, it's actually before your time. The policy committee goes back to Sam all the time and says, why are we doing another study? Why are we doing another study? That is an, that is an ongoing theme of policy committee. Been We've got some big projects in here, which, in fact, more than we'll find money to pay for. But we've got 13 railway projects. We've got this yeah. BRT light. We've got a Stafford Transit Center in Stafford. We've got um, a bunch of bike head projects. And some of those are quite big, um, all in the study. And the idea at the end of it is that the region will have 20 some odd projects that over the next 10 years they can put into funding applications and actually get constructed. So it's going to provide the region with an opportunity to pick and choose. Oh, we like number three, number five, and number seven. Let's build those. So it's going to get a, give a plethora of options for the region to have in the future that they can decide to progress with. And if they don't like two and seven, they no, leave those on the table and say, no, we're not going to build those. Right. So, but there's some really big projects in there, um, and the phase two we haven't even we haven't even got to the roadway yet. Any last comment from anybody? I want to. You asked a couple of you if we can get out earlier than last time. Well, we already are 
going to be earlier than last time if we if we stop now. But if this is your last chance to make any comments on this, Dave, we will fix the type of errors in the document. <laughs> If I do have some follow-up comments, this is a question that goes to me. Send them to me. I'll do it today. Thank yeah. you. And uh, we've got one new staff member, which some of you have already met, Becky Golden, who's joined us. She's helping me with manage the operation here at Pampo. And I'm just waiting for another person to sign. I've offered a position to another person for our Title VI and Public Engagement Coordinator. Hopefully they'll sign this afternoon and then we have that person taken care of. And we're advertising for another planner to replace Matthew. So we'll be fully staffed, I, I hope, within the next month. That'll actually be the first time that we've been fully staffed since I arrived here. Thanks, everybody. Look forward to seeing you. There are the t dates for the proposed dates for the future meetings. Could you suggest what time of day works good for all of you? I know some of you come all the way from Northern Virginia. Some of you teach classes. Some of you have other meetings. What time of day works for you? We've had meetings at 9.30 a.m. We've had meetings at 1 p.m. We've had meetings at 10. What time of day is good for you? Because I'll schedule those three, which are largely going to be phase two meetings. So you're going to get into the roadway stuff and the big projects that Dave is keen on. Uh, those are proposed dates. What time of day? This works well for me, honestly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One o'clock. Does this work well for you? Everybody else? Want me to schedule them at one o'clock again? Yeah. All right. So one o'clock on those three dates will be your three meetings. Now you know in advance, and you don't have to try and schedule and faff and fiddle. And uh, our new consultant, we're looking forward to. They will make some proposals and suggestions at those on those three dates here in this room. Thanks, you all. The meeting ended within a short time. I hope this was early enough for you. Yeah, just to be clear, it's just